speaking to Jason Hewitt, who is the author of Devastation Road. Welcome, Jason. Hello. Now, tell us a little bit about your latest book, because it, it follows on from the very successful Dynamite Room. How difficult was it to follow up a successful novel with, a, with another, another successful novel? <laughs> um, well, actually, when I started writing it, I didn't know how successful the Dynamite Room was going to be. Right. So, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't really know. But what I did have was a two-book deal with um, Simon and Schuster, so I knew that they bought the Dynamite Room and really enjoyed it. So the initial problem mentally for myself was, okay, they bought this one book that they really like, um, and, now, and then they're going to want a second book that is this unknown thing that I haven't created yet and is I need to create out of nothing but the flotsam and jetsam in my head and, and hope that they enjoy it. Um, did, they set so, you, did they set you a deadline for this for the second book? They did. Um, did you have a deadline for the first book or was it? No, so the, the book, well, the Dynamite Ring was finished um, when they bought it. So they gave me a deadline for the second book and it went fine until I think every book you hit a sticky patch mm -hmm. and the sticky patch for Devastation Road coincided with the publication of the Dynamite Ring in hardback in the UK um, and so I was busy doing events for that and not really getting a clean stretch at the writing and the reviews for the Dynamite Ring started to come in and they were all very good and people were very excited about it. And I was wandering around the country, um, giving events and talking about it and parading it around and people were stroking it and loving it and saying nice things. Devastation Road proved tricky. Dynamite Room was sort of shining at its, its brightest at that time. And it does have quite similar themes to your first book in that it is set in World War Two, although at the mm -hmm. end of World War II. Um, so what is it that fascinates you about this era in history? Well, I think it's, it's an incredible period in terms of uh, the change that took place um, within society, within politics. It affected absolutely every single person that was living at the time. Um, so, so that for me makes it interesting in terms of character, characters changing over the period of a novel and how they're very different to, say, for example, with Devastation Road, we've got a character called Owen. Mm -hmm. And actually, his past is very different to his present. Um, so, it, it's a vat of amazing stories in terms of the the, the period. Um, and I really enjoyed researching the war for the dynamite ring. And so, I didn't actually. It never crossed my mind that I might write something in a different period at all. I just thought, no, I'll just right. I'll keep do something going. else. I'll keep going. Um, but I think that the dynamite ring. I I came across a story. That well, I wanted to write a story with a dynamite room that was very different to every other war novel that mm. I could see on the bookshelves, and to tackle elements of the war that I knew very little about. So, mm. for example, in that mm. book, there's a storyline in Norway in 1940, um, which I had not really come across before. Um, so, when I wrote Devastation Road, or I was coming up with the idea for Devastation Road, I thought, okay. I'm going to stick with this period, let me find something else that I know very little about, an element of it that I know little about, which I can then, um, you know, it is interesting for me in terms of researching it rather than so just this, writing it. Because it starts with Owen, one of your main yes. characters, and he has this incredible journey that he embarks on at the end of the war. Yeah, it starts just as a few days before peace is declared in Europe. Mm. So I wanted to write about, I knew very little about the very end of the war. I could literally probably, before I started the research, I probably could have written on a postcard, you know, right. the, the facts I knew about the end of the war. Um, so I wanted to kind of research that, you know, that end point, but not to talk about, you know, how we usually perceive the end of the war, which, say, for example, in London is the, you know, the crowds in yeah, Trafalgar Square and the celebrations and yeah, people hanging from yeah. lampposters with union, union jacks around their neck. And mm, yeah. um, I wanted to talk about 
where the war really took place in terms of the fields where the battles took place and the villages yeah. and you know the, the heartlands of, of Europe so um, so tell us a bit more about Owen and also your other two characters because you have two other characters mm -hmm. that, that um, sort of inform your story and are central to Owen's journey in a way yes yeah, so Owen wakes up in a field at the beginning of the novel he has no idea where he is or how he got there he's injured he's wearing clothes that don't belong to him um, and he doesn't even know when he is so actually he's, he thinks it's 1942 1943 in fact it's May 1945 so he's lost a, a chunk of his memory um, and then picks himself up and attempts to make his way home um, not even realizing that he's not in England to start off with mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's his journey um, and because he's lost his memory as he makes this journey and attempts to get home he kind of picks up the pieces of his his past as he goes um, and kind of rebuilds his his story um, so it's a it's a typical quest i suppose mm -hmm. um the you know the typical um, journey and then along the way he's joined by a couple of other main characters so one is a boy called yannick mm -hmm. who is 15 year old Czech boy. And why did you decide to bring in a teenager into the story? Because I wanted to create some interesting dynamics and I thought it would be very easy to have two or three other adults on the scene and actually I think because Yannick is 15 he's quite an interesting age because He's, he's not a child, and obviously the war makes men of boys mm -hmm. in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also quite naive. He's, he's quite naive still, so he kind of is trying to be the man you know, in the situation, um, but kind of going about it in, a, you know, in the, the wrong way a lot of the time. Um, I see him as a bit of a bull in the china shop. He kind of has these very strong ideals. Um, but doesn't really know how to carry them through and doesn't really know what the implications of any, any of his actions ever are. Mm. Mm. Um, and he's Czech, so he speaks very little English. Um, yes, now you, in your research, you learnt the language, I, I Yes. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not going to um, ask you to say anything now. Oh, okay. um, and, um, and what does what that That means I speak a little Czech, yes. Right, okay. Um, um, in their conversations, because they can't communicate in the same language, so it's um, that also is an interesting dynamic in the book. Mm. So why did you particularly feel you needed to go off and learn the language? Well, I thought to start off with, I thought it's a it's a journey, and actually on a journey in terms of you know story writing, then you your character is usually joined by other characters. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well I got Owen in Europe. Um, it would be incredibly convenient if the people he came he stumbled across happened to be English yes. too, or spoke English. And you know that's not realistic to the situation, the time, the period. So, um, so yeah, so so he meets Yannick, and Yannick is Czech and speaks mainly well, speaks Czech with very very basic English. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's actually more realistic, um, and also it. Um, I think it helps with Owen's sense of isolation, so he doesn't really, mm -hmm. he's in a country that he doesn't know, he doesn't speak the language of the people he's with, so he kind of falls in on himself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So and I wanted to kind of investigate that in terms of his memory loss and kind of, you know, spending a lot of time in his head as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I had Yannick speaking Czech. Um, and so I thought well, I also need to, if he's speaking Czech, I don't want to put a translation in the writing for the benefit of the reader because that's not how Owen is seeing the situation. He doesn't yeah. understand what Yannick says. Yeah. So I thought I'm going to have to write bits of it in Czech. Um, and I don't like doing things by halves. No. So, okay. so I was like, okay, well, if we're going to speak, if he's going to speak Czech, then um, I at least need to know how to pronounce Czech and need to know the basics yeah. and it will help me get into his character as mm. well. Mm. So I learned basic Czech. Although, having said that, obviously in these sorts of classes I was primarily learning learning 
you know, where is the post office and right. can I have a ham sandwich please rather than... So you actually did classes? I did classes, right. um, okay. but I didn't learn um, you know, what would be more useful for the novel. I didn't learn about sort of how to explain about the, you know, the situation in Prague or something like that. Right. Okay. Um, but I also met a very good, obviously I had a great Czech teacher so my Czech teacher checked the Czech for me. Right, in, in the novel. <laughs> in the novel. <laughs> That's always helpful. Um, yes, and kind of corrected me right. on, on quite a few things. Okay. Um, and also, um, you didn't stop there, you also did the same journey that your characters do in this book. So yes. tell us a little bit about, about that, that journey that you went on. Well, again, it didn't like, you know, I, did, I didn't, didn't cross my mind not to to write another war novel and it also didn't cross my mind that actually I could actually just do the research at, at my desk via Google Maps or something <laughs> like that. Mm -hmm. I thought actually, well, if the journey, if the story is about a journey, then I need to take the journey. Right. <laughs> um, so and, how, long, and how long did you spend? So I went twice actually. So I right. went in May, um, which I went actually, I started the journey on the 2nd of May, which is the date that the novel starts. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to walk through the landscape at the right time of year so I could see yeah. what the countryside was like yeah. and, you know, what was in bloom and that sort of stuff. Um, and then, and I did most of the trek then, um, and then I went back again in September um, to kind of revisit some of the places. Okay. Um, so did you have a guide that went with you? No, you so what I did is I had maybe four or five key scenes that I already knew were going to be set in key locations yeah. that, and they were kind of like on my map it was like key pinpoints mm -hmm. that I knew I needed to hit right. um, and then I walked some of it um, Owen walks a fair amount of it mm -hmm. I walked mm -hmm. um, probably about I don't know half of what he did and then occasionally I would jump on a train and right. kind of fast forward <laughs> yeah. a bit um, and I took loads of photographs and I came across actually the locations for some of the smaller scenes actually while I was travelling myself. So actually, you know, there's a key scene in a, in a crumbled abandoned house on the edge of a river. So I actually mm -hmm. found mm -hmm. that location, um, which gave me the idea for the setting for that particular scene. Right. and kind of took notes there and then on the spot and kind of brainstormed what I was going to write about. He suffers from memory loss mm -hmm. in the book. So, did you need to um, research that as well? What the kind of the way it would um, show itself in in an individual? Yes, I did. So, I did primarily sort of scientific and medical research, um, as in reading books mm -hmm. about it and articles about it. Um, I didn't speak to anyone that suffers from memory loss, and the reason why I didn't do that is because. Um, it affects everyone in a very, very different way. So there are certain symptoms, I mean, depending on, you know, how it's been brought about, whether mm -hmm. it's an illness mm -hmm. or a hit to the head or, or whatever, it affects people in different ways. Um, but I kind of made notes of all the, you know, the, the, the secondary symptoms, um, sort of confusion, you know, and, illness and of was, aggression, that sort of thing. Was that something you always wanted in your novel? Is that so yes, I think part of the novel. I mean, that's how the novel begins. Yes, it it was because I'm fascinated with memory and the idea that actually we are, with the accumulation of our memories, um, and the dynamite room was very much about memory in terms of there's a, there was a a, a main storyline, but actually underneath that there was a, a a large substantial backstory that were all you know from the two main characters' memories. Um, so it was built on memories, whereas actually with Devastation Road, what I, what I wanted to do was think about what happens if you take the me memory away from someone, mm -hmm. then do we lose a sense of our identity, um, who we are? Um, and I think it was particularly prevalent in terms of looking at the war, so I think we're, we're now entering an era where um, you know, we're 70 years on from the, you know, the end of Second World War, mm -hmm. we are about to lose the war generation. Mm -hmm. And if we, when we lose the war generation, 
our view on the war will change because it will slip into a it won't be living memory it will be a deeper you know deeper part of history um, and my fear is that um, when we lose the war generation and it's no longer part of living memory then do we stop being afraid of what happened during the war because it feels more distant mm. to us mm. and then if we lose that fear then it's more likely to happen again. Um, and you recently wrote a, a fantastic piece about the current refugee crisis and the similarities between um, the journey that happens at the end of World War II mm -hmm. and the current um, crisis at the moment. Also in your um, in your piece that you wrote, you talk about the public's reaction to it. Yeah, I think, you know, along with many, many, many other people, I've been horrified by the current refugee crisis that, that's happening. Um, and it was particularly, it felt particularly raw to me because I spent two years, you know, working on Devastation Road, um, you know, which is about a refugee crisis, so, you mm -hmm. know, 11.5 million people displaced in Europe in you know, 1944 and they all needed to be you know looked after and cared for and and, um, and dealt with somehow um, so so I think it's it's the current crisis definitely echoes in my mind at least mm. what was happening in 1945 um, there are differences in terms of the situation. I think you know they're both they're both stemming from war. Um, in 1945, people have been displaced; they've been taken from their countries and they've been put somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and the situation was of what you know the, what happened to ha what needed to happen was that these when the camps were emptied and people were taken out of labour camps and. Um, you know, concentration camps and prison and war camps is that this is a gross oversimplification but they needed to be taken home mm. and sent home mm. and once they got home then that crisis was sort of dealt with um, and again this is a, it's a, a simplification of it um, with the current situation it's kind of tipped on its head actually these people are leaving home mm. they're being forced mm. out of their countries um, there's no clear end point we don't know where they you know some that some of them have very clear ideas about where they want to go to Germany and Sweden the UK and other places um, but they yeah so they, they have a clear idea about where they want to go to but there's there's no clear solution to the problem mm. as in mm. We have a you know, war in Syria that we know from our previous experience with doing, trying to involve ourselves in, in other wars in other countries, it's very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just happening in Syria, we have other flashpoints around that region which you know, is all accumulating to form a very complex situation. Um, and like the war, we've governments try to come together mm -hmm. to form a solution mm -hmm. and there was quibbles about this and squabbles about that, how is it going to be paid for, who's going to take so many mm. people, who's mm. going to do this, who's going to do that. Um, so again that echoes exactly what was happening in 1945 when they tried to set up um, UNRWA, which was the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. Um, and that took a long time to set up and was disorganised to mm. start off with. Mm. and. Um, under-resourced and badly managed um, and so it, again today's situation you know kind of echoes all of that mm -hmm. but I think what happens is that during World War Two, the general public kind of do an awful did an awful lot you know they, these were people that joined relief agencies that gave food that gave clothing mm -hmm. um, in the UK we had the kinder um, transport you know, just before the war where we took 10,000 Jewish children from Germany and out of Poland and places like that and brought them to England to look after them knowing that the crisis was about to kick off um, and I think here we have, we've had another kind of call for arms that comes from the public mm. Um, mm. you know the images that we saw this you know, poor three-year-old child yeah. Yeah. you know kind of really galvanized the, the public to, to act and then we mm. 
put pressure on the government, which is why in the UK David Cameron then announced that we were going to take you know, 20,000 refugees in, whereas previously he'd said that, that we weren't going to take mm. so many. Mm. Um, mm. So I think it does, the public can do an awful lot to pressurise governments. Mm. So I think we need to do more, but I mean governments need to do more, yeah. more too. Do you think there are lessons that we can learn from the previous, um, from World War II? I think, well the problem with history is that we, we know what the lessons are but we don't <laughs> take an awful lot of notice right. of them. Um, so we need to work more closely together in terms mm. of the, Euro the European countries or international communities need to um, park their differences mm -hmm. um, and um, this sounds like I'm on a crusade but yeah. let's fight the common good um, and to to re remind ourselves that we are fellow human beings and actually you know this the refugees that come in from Syria or wherever else are fellow human beings these mm -hmm. are families these mm -hmm. are doctors these are nurses these are teachers um, are just as we are mm -hmm. and that actually mm -hmm. we need to you know we need to st stop the internal squabbling within the European community we need to uh, come together and actually you know do something about these 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 issues um, unfortunately the sad thing is is that there's always going to be conflict um, and we are always going to have um, crises such as this happening but it's how we deal with these that's important I think and so for you what's next for you now another book another book yes so still in World War two um, I'm edging out of World War two right Devastation Road, we loved it. Congratulations Thank you. on your latest book and good luck with um, working on your next novel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Jason. You.